Hello and welcome to Tiny ML Webinars. Today, uh, Andres Gomez, he'll be talking about machine learning without batteries, the case for light-powered Tiny ML. Before that, uh, let's uh, see if you talks. They are uh, supported by our strategic partners, including Aeon Device, Arm, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Emza, Photohub, Green Waves, Gravity, HOTG, Imaging Mob, Eichmers, Clica Tech, Latent AI, uh, what's the next one? Maxim Integrator, which is part of Analog Now, Micro AI, NXP, Profis, Qualcomm, Quixo, Reality AI, Renaissance, Rexon, SAP, Seed, Sensimal, Sony, ST, uh, Stream Analyze, Synsense, and Sentient. Next. Uh, I want to uh, make sure that you, you, you at least try to uh, attend parts of this tiny ML summit, which is taking place in person between March 28 and 30 in uh, uh, San Francisco. And the tiny ML research symposium, that's on March 28 as well. Uh, our next tiny ML trail blazer series uh, uh, discussion is with Eric Pan, and that will take place on April the 6th. Uh, please, uh, if you're not already a part of the Tiny ML community on Meetup or on LinkedIn, here are the links to join. Currently, we have uh, more than 8,000 members on Meetup and more than uh, 2,500 on LinkedIn. Uh, you can subscribe to the uh, TinyML YouTube channel. All the all the webinars that we host are uh, are present over there. Uh, our next TinyML talk uh, is uh, on March the eighth. So let me introduce uh, Andres Gomez to you. Uh, he was uh, born in the U.S and raised in the U.S., and then he moved on to Colombia. From there, he went to Italy, and finally, he settled in Switzerland. Uh, he got his PhD from ETH Zurich, and right now, it is working as a postdoctoral fellow at University of St. Gallen, and his areas of interest are uh, embedded uh, systems and also low-power systems, especially battery-less systems, and this is what he's going to talk about today. Okay, so uh, thank you, Altaf, for the introduction and for the invitation to speak to you today. My talk will be about um, running uh, tiny ML on light powered devices. But before I begin, I would like to ask the audience a quick question Did any of you ever own one of these cell phones? This is the Nokia. 1110. Um, it came out almost 20 years ago. I used to have one back when I was doing my, my bachelor's. And uh, I remember that I used to be able to have the cell phone um, for multiple days without needing to charge it. Right? And this was a very nice feature to have in old uh, cell phones. And it was impressive that it could do this even though it has a battery of only 850 milliamp hours. It was, it was very impressive at the time. Most likely your cell phone that you own in, in present day looks something like this. So this is the, um, the iPhone 13 Pro Max. It came out only a few months ago. And like most smartphones today, uh, you barely get through the entire day without running out of batteries. And this is the case, even though the battery is more than 4,000 milliamp hours, which is you know, a significantly, <laughs> many, several times the battery of the Nokia 1110. So what I want to say with this example is that there is a, has been a trend in the smartphone market that as functionality has increased, right? Obviously the iPhone 13 can do way more things than the old Nokia 1110, but as the functionality has increased, so has the cost, the size of the device, and naturally the battery, and as well the environmental impact of producing these devices. 
right? The cost, for example, is, is a big thing, right? iPhone 13 is costs almost as much as a laptop compared to the old Nokia 1110, which was significantly more uh, inexpensive. Now, this trend I've also started to see in the Internet of Things. And in the Internet of Things, what we want to do is we want to make environments and devices smarter at several different scales. We can talk about the quantified, quantified self, understanding better our habits, our behavior. You can think about it also as well as in smart homes and smart cities so that we can control more intelligently our infrastructure. But uh, we want to do all of this for many reasons, right? And for example, for smart homes, we spend a significant amount of time indoors. Right? And without making efficient use of the resources that we have, it might lead to increased CO2 emissions and uh, significant um, energy inefficiencies in terms of how much our society consumes as a whole. So with this in mind, there are several things that we can do from the perspective of sensing to improve the current situation. Current sensing devices look somewhat like this. We have a big battery and a little bit of silicon on top to do the actual interesting uh, sensing. In certain cases, the batteries can be up to 90% of the volume. You can see this in, in this simple example. And if, especially when you need um, specialized batteries right, that have a wider temperature range, for example, the cost can be up to 50% of the whole bill of materials. What I do in my research is I try to design novel uh, paradigms so that we can do sensing, but do it in a different way that is much more cost effective. So instead of using batteries with rare earth metals, we can use low cost, hopefully organic comp components. Uh, I also want to design devices that are maintenance free. So uh, we can tap into, for example, the light infrastructure that we have built for over a century to have indoor lighting. And we want these devices to be environmentally friendly, right? Which goes into being more energy efficient, not needing, for example, to replace batteries um, every few months because they run out. We want these devices to be more robust and reliable and have a much, much longer uh, deployed life. So this is generally what I do in my research. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about myself. As Aldaf mentioned, I, am, I was born and raised in New York City, but as my name implies, uh, my heritage comes from abroad. I'm, my parents are Colombian, so I'm Colombian American, uh, but I've been living here in Switzerland for over 10 years. Um, my PhD um, at ETH Zurich was on the topic of batteryless sensing system. I did this in two research institutes, one more focused towards software aspects, another one focused more on the hardware aspects. After this, I worked for a few years in industry at a company called Vidomico in Zurich, uh, where I was working on wireless uh, devices and uh, where I started, for example, a project called the MetaCard, which we'll talk about uh, later on today. Uh, since um, a year and a half, roughly, no, a little less, <laughs> a year and a few months, I've been a postdoctoral fellow at the University of St. Gallen at the relatively new Department of Informatics, where I continue my research in um, bringing, let's say, intelligent batteryless sensing systems into the internet of things and the web of things. So let me set the, top, the context of how, uh, <clears throat> let's say we build these sensing systems, right? They typically have this device life cycle. When we design a, a new system and we <clears throat> first do an initial deployment, it's kind of like the birth of the system, right? And initially we have some tests we must do let's say some additional configurations to make sure that everything is working properly. And after this phase, then the system uh, is set to reach maturity. It's in production, it does what it needs to do. And as is natural, we as designers want to just freeze time and make, you know, hope that the system stays in this mature productive state indefinitely. However, these sensing systems, much like human life, at some point, they do age. And when they age at some point, they simply stop performing and they need replacement. They reach their end of service. When we analyze component agent, uh, sorry, component aging, 
Uh, there are different sources of aging for different types of component. When you look at silicon, so for example, microcontrollers and things like this, generally uh, silicon vendors say that uh, assuming you keep the right temperature and the voltage supply and things like this, it could theoretically be as reliable for millennia, right? Obviously these assumptions are not that realistic, right? Temperature varies and voltage might vary. Um, so harsh conditions can of course decrease this, but in general, silicon reliability is not an issue. When we have uh, batteries, this is typically one of the key aspects where sensing systems can die because after only a few hundred cycles of charging and, and recharging, batteries simply lose their performance, their ability to store energy, and they will die, right? We know this also from our own life, computers, old computers, laptop computers, their, their battery doesn't last um, very, doesn't last very, very long. Solar panels though, similar to silicon, you need to keep them in the right temperature range uh, and make sure that, you know, they, they're not stressed mechanically and things like this, but theoretically they could last for several decades, right? So solar panels can offer us uh, a way to harvest energy for a very, very long time, uh, possibly much longer and have a much longer lifetime than batteries, okay? But when you look at this normal um, life cycle, it's worth asking the question is, are long lifetimes the only desirable go goal to have when we design these systems? And to try to give you a little bit more insight into this question, let me first uh, talk about two different things, right? The predictability and the resilience of a, of the, a sensing system can have. So when we have this mentality that the system should live as long as possible, uh, this is when we are looking towards predictability, right? Because uh, we want them to last, you know, for, or be able to determine how, like, uh, how long the device will last. And to do this, we usually have a very large energy cycle, right? So a large battery, for example, this means that the full state of the battery and the empty state of the battery are very far away. And the battery very, very slowly discharges over a certain amount of time. And we're able to say, for example, we sell the device saying, this device has a battery lifetime of three years, right? This is the normal mentality. The issue with this is that charging is expensive, right? If we had a huge battery that is depleted, getting that battery back up to the fully charged status will take a significant amount of energy. A different perspective is that instead of systems living as long as possible, they should revive as quickly as possible, right? And when we have this mentality, what we trend to do is we, have, we tend to have very small energy cycles, which means that the full state and the empty state are very, very close together. Now, this means of course that it empties very quickly, but it also means that it charges very quickly, right? And, and this is then a, a good property to have. So when we compare these two approaches, we see that the first one is of course a very predictable life, right? Which is the current embrace of most sensing systems in the market. And this very nicely corresponds to our own human life. Right? We have the deployment, the maturity, um, aging, and then out of service. When we have this um, resilient perspective, it basically means that our devices are like little zombies that can die very often. And with a little bit of energy, they can revive and start doing things. Right? So this is the design paradigm that we need to have when we think about batteryless sensing systems. Now, since I'm been talking about energy cycles and energy storage, let me first talk a little bit about this. There are many different trade-offs when you think about different ways of storing energy. The recharge cycles is one of the things that I, I mentioned as being the key um, issue to component aging. Uh, but different technologies have different recharge cycles and they have different power density and energy density and leakage. And one simple way to compare all these different technologies is through something called the Ragone plot. And this is, this looks something like this. On the X axis, we have the power density and the power density is indicative of how uh, ease or how, how fast I can either charge or discharge the energy storage. 
On the y-axis, we have the energy density, which means or it gives an indication of how much energy they can store right, per unit of, of weight in this case. So batteries, uh, when they're up here in the, in the top left, they have a very high energy density, which means that they can store a lot of energy, but they have a very low power density, which means that they, I, if I discharge them too quickly, I, can, I will damage them. Right? So I need to uh, discharge it very slowly. Right? So I'm not going to go through all the different technologies. What I just want to say that in the context of this batteryless mentality, what we want to have is a very high power density, so we can very quickly discharge our capacitors, for example. And we want to have very high recharge cycles, right? So that theoretically, if I can have a theoretically infinite number of recharge cycles, so that the energy storage does not become the central point of aging and, um, and end of service. So generally, the best technology that I found that, could, that can um, that has these two properties is ceramic capacitors. So ceramic capacitors, you can dis discharge and charge very quickly, and they tend to have extremely high recharging cycles, theoretically infinite, of course, with the asterisk that you need to keep them in the right temperature and voltage range. All right, so in energy-driven design, this paradigm that systems are only alive when they can receive energy from the environment, our general system looks something like this. We have a sporadic source, right? So not a battery, something that is sporadic, which is composed of an environment that provides something, either light or temperature or movement. And then we have here a, um, a transducer, which converts this primary energy from the environment into a, a, an energy buffer, right? So in this case, I, I'm, I, I put a picture here of a ceramic capacitor, as I mentioned from the slide before. So this sporadic source will then power <clears throat> uh, the application circuit, right, which is what we're normally used to, some sensors, a microcontroller, and some sort of radio to transmit the information to some endpoint, either a smartphone or a server. So the key aspect of this energy driven design is that the sporadic source is inexpensive as opposed to an expensive battery. Uh, the application circuit is sporadically powered, so it does die at some point with zero, so it consumes zero. And, but the information flow is now non-deterministic because we cannot give any certainty that, for example, we can get one sample every minute. Right? It will entirely depend on what the uh, environment provides. So the key metric that I mentioned from before is that they wake up very quickly. And if you design your right system, and let's say it has nice properties, these systems can go from completely powered off to completely functional in only a few seconds, right? One to 10 seconds, depending obviously on the environment. So let me then uh, go into some details about the sporadic sources. Um, afterwards, I'll mention then some application circuits. And then finally, I'll go into a specific application uh, that involves running a machine learning model on a specific application circuit. So the first thing, uh, by the way, sorry, maybe this is a good point to stop for questions. Altaf, do you know uh, if there are any questions? Uh, I think you can move along for now. Okay. So we'll ask them later, yeah. All right, so the first thing you should know about energy harvesting is that there is a great power imbalance. So if we have here an axis of just power, and here this is a, a logarithmic axis of going from microwatts to a watt. When we look at the harvesting side, uh, transducers, uh, here I'm normalizing them by area. Uh, there are many different types of transducers, right? RF, thermal, uh, piezoelectric, and photovoltaics. When you look at their power density, so how much power they generate per unit of area, photovoltaics tend to be the highest one, right? Roughly maybe one milliwatt per squared centimeter in the best case scenario. However, the environment is of course variable. And so here it's really a range. A photovoltaic cell can in the best case scenario have one milliwatt, but on average it's gonna be very, very low. And at night or in the absence of light, it's obviously going to be zero. So this is the harvesting side, the production side. On the application side for the energy consumption, generally, depending on what it is that you're using, your camera, you're, you're using a flash memory, uh, an expensive or, or particular radios, 
the active energy consumption is usually in the range of several milliwatts, right? Up to maybe even a watt if you have some, uh, you know, powerful uh, RF uh, system that needs to send uh, very far distances. So this is, of course, an imbalance. The important thing is that for most of our applications, we can have a sleep state, right? And usually, depending on which types of systems you can you can use, most microcontrollers are around the one microwatt, so maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. But then, by leveraging this, we can uh, we can make sure that we um, the average energy consumption is following very closely the average energy production, right? Because they do need to be balanced. But then this raises the question, okay, how much energy can I really get from an environment, right? And, and to really answer this question, it's really challenging, right? Uh, here I have a picture of several colleagues of mine. Uh, we're trying to figure out how much energy we can produce from having wearable TEGs. TEGs are thermal electric generators. And to really do a measurement in a real case scenario, uh, we need to do a complicated setup, right? Uh, here, my, my colleague Lucas was carrying a car battery and AC inverter and powering these, um, say, expensive and accurate measurement equipment to be able to really measure how much current was being generated here. Right? So this is this is difficult. Um, so to, to sort of address this issue, uh, Lucas and I, we um, took matters into our own hand and we designed the rocket logger device to facilitate these types of measurements. So this is a simplified uh, setup uh, doing something similar to before. Here we have TEGs and a solar cell. And with the setup, we're able to more easily uh, acquire the data and answer these questions of how much energy we can really get. And so the rocket logger has multiple current channels and voltage channels, and it also has digital channels so we can have the application uh, send different types of, of signals so we can recognize what it's doing. This is an open source project uh, that you can easily free uh, download all of the all of the sources and the software and the hardware design, and you can even make your own in case you're interested. Um, this this project has been quite successful. It's been used in by many different research groups in different countries in Europe and in the U.S. So. With this rocket logger device, we made um, uh, an indoor deployment um, to really find out how much energy can we get from small photovoltaic cells. And so this was done uh, during my PhD at ETH Zurich. And we had the following setup, right? So this is a solar cell. And without going into the details of the other, what, what's going on here, the only thing you need to know is that we were able to record over two years of data of, with, with high accuracy of how much uh, so how much this solar cell could, uh, how much energy it could harvest right throughout the entire day. The data set is publicly available, so you can download this here over two years, as I mentioned. Um, we also gathered uh, some, some small um, ambient uh, sensors like luminance and, and I think temperature and humidity as well. So let me show you some of the results of this, of this data set. So we had here, I'm just selecting four different nodes. This is the floor plan. And I've selected four different uh, nodes that were located in different places. So number D, uh, letter D, for example, it's close to a window and it's, uh, it's an east facing window. So it has a lot of light in the morning. And a, a node A, for example, is far away from the window. There's a tree here, so it doesn't get that much natural light. When we look at the uh, daily energy that the, these devices were able to harvest, you can see here uh, for the different nodes, and this these energies are in joules. Uh, so node D here at some point during the summer where there was direct sunlight in the morning hours, it was able to harvest almost 80 joules of energy, which for sensing systems, it's, it's a very large amount. Right? Uh, but these other devices that were mostly uh, harvesting indoor energy from, sorry, from indoor lighting, they were harvesting on average, maybe two, three joules. Right? So here you see a very high variability, right? This is sort of the key aspect. Where you deploy your system uh, and how much light it gets plays a, obviously a huge role on how much energy your sensing devices will have, right? Um, and of course, also uh, human activity has a, a big impact, right? So we, as humans, like to um, like to have light when we're working. So 
the human presence uh, usually correlates very well with indoor lighting. So you might be wondering, okay, yes, battery systems are sound interesting, but you, know, you might ask, okay, when, when are they better than the normal battery-based uh, solutions? And the answer is in a very specific, uh, a specific scenario. So when, sorry, these things are <laughs> going by themselves. So when you have your primary energy uh, aligned perfectly with your information, this is when uh, batteryless systems are most efficient, right? Uh, they're multiple, uh, so they're most efficient because you can use the primary energy to get the electrical energy that you need to actually sense the information that you're interested in. And there are a few examples of this, right? I mentioned, for example, that human activity correlates with light, which means that here, an example of a batteryless camera, if you have a batteryless camera, for example, in an office, then at night, it's obviously it doesn't get any light, but there's no issue. I mean, it doesn't make sense to take dark pictures because there's no information there. And as soon as they're light, uh, then the cameras are able to power up and start taking pictures and actually extract information from the normal, from normal pictures. Right? And there are also other examples of this, for example, movement as well. You can harvest energy from movement to get information about the movement. Right? Um, there aren't, it's not a global solution, right? But there are some scenarios where it is indeed uh, better and more efficient than a normal battery-based solution. Let me then uh, jump a little bit into the into the details of how this this system, these systems works. Um, I've proposed something that is called the energy management unit. And this is basically a small intermediary that sits here between the transducer and the application circuit. And by decoupling this, we can have uh, several advantages. So one important one is that we can simultaneously optimize the energy input and the energy output. So this means that we could theoretically have a transducer that only is able to produce five microwatts and we can regulate it to have the maximum input power, but let's say it's five microwatts. And we can still have an application that when active consumes, for example, 100 milliwatts, right? Now you might be wondering, okay, the numbers are very different. How, how would that work? And it works because uh, we have a small capacitor and we're very selective about when the application actually uh, runs. Right? So obviously on average, the energy production matches the energy consumption, but we can have a big disparity in a short uh, period of time. So let me show you then how the transient behavior looks. So in the beginning when the, the capacitor in the energy management unit is charging up, so initially when it's zero volts, the application cir circuit is just completely turned off, right? zero, zero volts, zero watts. At some point, the EMU read passes a certain threshold and this, the application then enters sleep mode. And as we said before, sleep mode consumes very little energy. So the below the five microwatts, and then the, the EMU is anyway is able to continue accumulating some energy until it reaches a certain threshold. And when it reaches a certain threshold, only then does the application circuit actually turn on and consume for a small period of time with a very high power. So in this, in this way, we can, we can have this uh, temporary imbalance in terms of power, but still be able to uh, conserve energy and uh, have everything work quite nicely. So the question is, how much can we fit in this small energy band? Right? So we have an a task that consumes a certain amount of energy. Um, so one last thing about the EMU, what's really, um, I'd say one of the key features about the EMU is that the input power can be basically anything. It can be highly variable. The charge curve can look something like this, that at a certain point, the environment stops producing energy and the, the buffer can go down. None of this matters. The important thing is simply that it at some point reaches the maximum threshold so that there is an activation. And um, we do have some converters uh, in between, which means that there is a, a small efficiency loss in terms of the, the conversions from different voltages to you know different yeah to have different voltage domains, but overall um, for many measurements the we could say that the energy efficiency can be pretty high up to ninety percent right based on when we, when you're using the right converters for example buck converters. 
All right, so then uh, when we have these battery systems, we need to make sure that our application is compatible with power cycling, right? Because otherwise we won't be able to do these nice uh, sleep states and, and controlled activation. So our application circuit must be compatible with this. Uh, in terms of the sensors, this is usually fairly okay, right? Digital sensors, most of them you can easily control, uh, turn on for a little bit, for example, take a picture and then turn off again. These are usually quite fine. For the computation, depending on how much it is, if the computation is small enough, you can also fit it in one of those little activations and you don't need to do any complicated state retention and things work quite nicely. For transceivers, also, it's, it, it's luckily quite nice. Uh, assuming that you have a synchronous communication, you have full control of when you turn on your transceiver, when you send your packet, and then you turn it off. Right? So when you have these assumptions, you are able to have complicated applications that are able to execute reliably, regardless of how much energy uh, the environment provides you with, right? whether it's two gels from node A or whether it's 80 gels from node D. Right, all everything will work quite nicely. Right, the only difference is that, of course, if you have more energy, you execute many more times, but the reliability of it will be handled quite nicely by the EMU. All right, so now let me go into the uh, details of reliable execution. Unless there's any question for the let's say from the sporadic source, yeah, there, there is uh, one question about the uh, capacitors that. Normal capacitors have a leakage, so there must be some low leakage capacitors. Okay. All right. Yes. So, uh, great question. It was it was a metric that I, I didn't discuss it. Right. So, when you have super capacitors, these usually have relatively high leakage um, because, in general, it's not easy to to store energy. Right. As soon as you store energy, it tries to come out somehow. What I can say from um, small capacitors, when you have things, for example, in the ceramic capacitor that I mentioned, uh, the picture changes a bit uh, because it's so little energy that's being stored electrostatically, the leakage tends to be relatively low. And the relative term is uh, particularly um, with reference to the sleep power, right? So there will always be leakage, but when you already have an application circuit that it's connected, and let's say you have the one microwatt, so this, if you take this into account into the leakage, then this is generally what dominates, right? I, I don't have the specific numbers, but let's just, uh, as an example, let's say that a small ceramic capacitor has a leakage of, I don't know, one nanowatt, right? So as soon as you connect anything, most commercial microcontrollers, they will automatically dominate the, the leakage rate, right? So, but it's, it's obviously an important question. Um, there are many different technologies that try to minimize leakage. Mm -hmm. All right. So now let me um, discuss about reliable execution of tasks. Right? The simplest example that I can come up of uh, uh, come up with for explaining reliable task execution is a small Bluetooth sensor. All right. So this uh, I'm going to give an example from this platform that we built. Um, and when you look, when you try to record the power trace of how, uh, how much energy it consumes to send packets, uh, it looks something like this. Right? So this is a power trace that I record with rocket logger. And once I trigger the device, then it takes a little bit to, to wake up. It takes, let's say, two, two milliseconds to turn on, or let's say to boot up. Then um, it takes a little bit to configure, for example, the radio to do Bluetooth. Um, Bluetooth uh, low energy advertisements. And then when it enters the transmission phase here, you write a, uh, some data into a buffer. And in this particular example, I had one Bluetooth advertisement per channel, per advertisement channel, right? So we have an activation with three transmissions for, with each one of these peaks. When we look at the energy consumed by this application, which just sends a, a constant daily advertisement, uh, we can do a thousand measurements and the probability density function looks something like this. The average value is approximately 108 microjoules and it has very, very little variability, right? It's, it's almost a, a small peak around this. So 
what I propose in my PhD is that um, we uh, look at the cumulative density function of this, which is basically a step function. And what I called the point where it reaches one, I called this the batteryless limit. And so according to my definition, a system can be batteryless if it stores at most the, the energy required to do one atomic task, right? One activation, like we're, we're hitting here the, the one with the CDF. When we do this, so we can do this, for example, with 109 microgels. And if our system is able to store this amount, then I can always guarantee that if, I'm, if I fill up this uh, energy storage, I can have reliable operation. And I can also have the minimum startup time because I don't wait for a very long time to charge a lot more than I need, right? So this is the thing about the resilience, right? As soon as I have enough energy to do something, I do it. So th this is my definition of a batteryless system. And just to tie this specific application to the um, energy measurements that I showed you a few slides ago, this system in indoor environments, even in this node A that has only indoor lighting, you can have, 28,000 activations per day. So when there is light, this system is able to have one of these transmissions roughly once per second, right? one of these activations with three packets and for roughly eight hours during the time in which there's light. Right? So which means that uh, with a very small solar cell of, it's a little bit bigger than this, but it's roughly 15 square millimeters, uh, square centimeters, sorry. Um, with a relatively small solar cell, we can tap into our um, indoor lighting infrastructure and have a lot of work done right, without the need for batteries. Now, an interesting side effect of, of, this, um, of this mentality of working only when there's light is that it also provides you with a little bit of notion of, of, um, of privacy, I called it here. And what I meant with this is simply that as a user, if you carry a wearable system, right, the, or let's say a if you carry a small device with you, like this card, then when you keep it in your pocket, it doesn't have any light, and you are certain that there is a full power down, right? The, the system is it's not in sleep, it's powered off. And this means that it's physically impossible for the device to gather any type of data, right? And when I, as a user, decide to make use of the device, then I expose it to light, and only then does the system actually wake up Right, and start doing what it's supposed to do, like gather data, process the data, transmit this data. Right, so this gives the user a way more agency over even like current smartphone devices that you cannot take off the battery. Right, so you, you know, even if it's powered off theoretically, uh, you can the, the, your cell phones can still be recording from the microphone. And you have no way of actually ensuring that they're not doing anything. So this picture here is of uh, a project called the meter card, which I, I mentioned briefly before. And um, so this, this meter card, well, then I started during my, my time at Miromiko, and it's a small batteryless device. It's ultra thin um, and it, it's powered by light. And what's interesting is that it has then a microcontroller with which we can, we can do interesting things with it. Right? This project is also open source. You're more than welcome to um, go to this website. Uh, you can download uh, the hardware design, you can download the software, or make it your own, do your own things. Uh, and I'm very happy that this actually received a tech transfer award a few months ago uh, in December uh, from, from the Hypeak Association in Europe. Right. So let me then um, focus into the, the media aspects of the talk about machine learning. Right? I've, I've talked uh, a lot about the battery this part. So now let me get to the, to the machine learning part uh, for, for battery list devices, right? We have all of these nice uh, building blocks on the Mibra card, right? It's light powered, it has user agency. I have different types of sensors, temperature, humidity, acceleration. I can transmit things with Bluetooth, but I also have an, a, like a powerful Cortex-M microcontroller there. So I have the capacity to do some interesting processing. So uh, the application that I'm gonna focus on today is about gesture detection, uh, right? So um, using the accelerometer to detect uh, different movements of pattern, patterns of movement on the meter card. 
Now, as opposed to what I just mentioned before about a, a single atomic task, where you can control very nicely when things are turned on and turned off, for, for gesture detection, we need a, a time series of data, right? So this is a, a little bit different from what I mentioned before, because as opposed to just waiting until you have enough energy to do something, you are also then requiring a specific time window of data that was sampled periodically. So then let me uh, briefly mention something about data streaming applications for battery systems, right? Traditionally, if you were to have a battery, the, accelerate, uh, the accelerometer would be on for a certain amount of time, let's say a few seconds, and uh, the, the duration of your classification window. And once it has enough data, then it just sends a message to the microcontroller saying, okay, I have all my data, please read it and classify it. With the batteryless application, you cannot do this, right? Because you don't know when you'll have enough energy. So as I mentioned before, the system starts in off state. When light, uh, when, when it's exposed to light, then it enters this sleep mode and it can also then activate the accelerometer because it usually consumes very little energy compared to a microcontroller. So during this phase, as we were building up, then we have to wait until both the energy management unit has enough energy, and I also have enough data to perform the classification, right? So now the, the triggering mechanism is a bit more complicated. And, but when these two conditions are met, then I can turn on, do what I need to do, and then go back to sleep. So this leads to a small inefficiency, right? Because I have now two dependencies and they're not necessarily correlated. And the inefficiency in particular, the, the worst one, or yeah, it's, it's, it's when they don't match up, right? So here I'm mentioning um, a optimistic case when you have too much energy. And let's say your system is fully charged in the middle of the classification window, right? So what happens is the energy management unit cannot continue to store energy because it's saturated, right? The energy storage is saturated. And so it's just waiting and it's losing energy because it's not capitalizing on the light that is there present. But you have to wait then until the classification window, and then and only then do you satisfy both requirements of having enough energy and have enough data to actually perform a classification, right? And so this then uh, implies some losses, right? Okay, so do, are there any questions so far about that part of the application circuits and reliable execution? Sure. Uh <clears throat> There is one question about uh, public data sets for uh, uh, power traces. Uh, do, you, do you know of any which are available online? All right, so there are a few. Um, the one that I, maybe this was after, or this was before I, I posted the, the link to mine. Uh, so there are multiple, so it's obviously, I completely agree that it's valuable to be able to explore this without having the, the required hardware. And multiple research groups uh, in different locations have published uh, different data sets throughout the years. The, the size of the data set varies. So for example, someone comes to mind from uh, the University of Columbia in New York. Uh, there was this project called Enhance and um, they also published a data set, but this is maybe 10 years old. Uh, I believe uh, the University of Dortmund in Germany, um, the Finet Lab project also published some data sets from indoor traces, I believe uh, that's the case. Mm, and so I, there I just mentioned three. I'm, I'm sure there are others, but I'm, I'm not, I'm, but they don't come off the top of my head. All right, so now let's, now that we've seen all these different <laughs> things related to battery systems, let's actually get to the, to the perhaps the most relevant topic to the tiny email community, which is the actually the machine learning model and running it on a small device. So to uh, actually to train the model, then obviously we have to go through a set for, for data acquisition. And we did this by training data from 12 participants, right? So we have the meetup cards for this particular part, we had batteries so that we can ensure that we were gathering all the data properly. Uh, then we distributed, uh, so we, we had a special way of, um, of capturing the data so that we can know the labels of it. So we, we had the several different gestures. So it was mostly the, the three about, so up and down, then sideways as a separate gesture, and then anything else was just called random. And we took uh, great care to make sure that we had enough data sets from the 12 participants in all three of these uh, classification sets. 
Um, then once we had all of these samples, the numbers that are the on samples, uh, then we, of course, divide our, our whole data set into training, validation, and testing uh, to, to, to be able to, to have the, our end model. Right? So for this part, uh, we partnered up with InfectSL. And I'm sorry, I, I just noticed that the inf is in white. So sorry, I'll tough. Oh, no, wait, sorry. Oh, no, okay. It's in, it's in, it's in gray. So InfectSL, this is, uh, they, they were our partners to, um, to do this type of training. What's very nice about the InfectSL models is that uh, it's very simple C code, right? And uh, it doesn't have any complicated arithmetic. Um, and so it uses very efficient data types. So just eight or 16 bit integers. And this means that it's very easy to adapt and to reuse and in, in basically any type of um, embedded microcontroller. Uh, so as a consequence of these data types and uh, energy efficient, or let's say the, the simple C code, it's it's quite uh, efficient in terms of energy and um, and also in memory. So now let me uh, briefly give you some um, results from the from the trained model. So here we have a confusion matrix for the um, for the different classes. So it's a random up, down, and sideways. And the overall performance is indeed quite nice. So here, just to uh, give you the summary, the, the accuracy was approximately 94%. 94 uh, it has high precision, high recall as well. Um, so this was just from the, say, from the training that was done by InfectSell. And once we receive this, um, this sort of trained model, then we can do uh, we can think about the embedded implementation, right? When we then go to the real uh, device, we have to think about this windowed data classification, right? So here, for example, I show a small window of um, five seconds of a data that was of, of a metal card that was being shaken sideways along the y along the y-axis. So here's why you see this, these nice little peaks. And so what we do is we basically uh, run a two uh, a two second window from this, and we run this through the classification model, and then from the classification model we have uh, an end result of just the classification of whether it was being shaken sideways, up or down, or just random movement. So we took this uh, trained model and uh, we integrated it into the Metocard software, and when we do the the um, energy characterization, again, using the Brock logger, it looks something like this, right? So before uh, we only had here the initialization, the configuration, and here at the very end, we had the three advertisement packets. So now there's a little bit more data reading here during the configuration phase. This is reading the accelerometer from the, from the data of two seconds um, at 10 Hertz, by the way, sorry, I didn't mention uh, the data, the accelerometer works at, at 10 Hertz. And then once the data is fed, then there is a processing phase of around 20 milliseconds or so to uh, get the, uh, the classification at the end. And once we get the classification, then we can um, transmit the, the end result. Right. So when we look at this single activation, which of course requires the, the, the whole data, the execution time was around 30 milliseconds. The amount of energy that we consumed was uh, 720 something microjoules. So a little bit more than before when we were just transmitting, but this still means that we can um, perform many of these classifications when, when, there's, um, when there's light. So now the, the sleeping state, because I'm also doing data gathering, it is significantly higher than before because the accelerometer is on and it's gathering data continuously. Um, and th there is some room for improvement here, but our current implementation uh, has a sleep and uh, data gathering consumption of 65 microwatts. I also wanted to highlight here in just another measurement, the, let's say how quick the cold start is. So the cold start, once more, is when the system is completely powered off, zero volts, everything is off. Uh, when we expose it to a 900 lux, it only takes around 10 seconds for the device to go from completely powered off to energized and booting up. And when you, when you see these uh, little, little steps going down, this is because it was, it was activated, right? So it had, this is, these are the two seconds 
for the data and the energy was already there. And so it was able to execute um, during the normal regular period of, of two seconds. So now I have some time to show you the demo, just a, a short demo about how we can use this accelerometer based uh, gesture to interact with different systems. And here we had, so we built a small little interface um, that was a web interface that allowed us to control uh, different smart devices. Right. So here you will see that we. I'm going to show you only for the for the smart light and for a robotic arm that we can control using just uh, some gestures, and um, and then here just this is just to indicate that the Mito card belongs to a specific user, and you can also here have the sensor readings from from the uh, from the Mito card as well as the gesture when it happens. Okay. So. As I mentioned, the way, the way it works is uh, there's the meter card, it's exposed to light, it transmits Bluetooth packets. Uh, there's a sort of intermediary that receives this and can send then normal packets using either Wi-Fi or internet to the smart devices that obviously also have a, a, or can accept incoming, incoming packets to, to do different types of control. I also use, so we use not, not just gestures, but just the inclination of it. So we can see the end result of, of how the card was inclined. And we use this as well to activate different different settings from the from the smart lights. Sorry, from the from the different dev smart devices. So for the smart light, we can use this inclination to change the light color, to change the intensity of the light. Um, and for in the case of the robot arm, we can also use it to uh, control the, the movement of the art based on the inclination of the card as well. So we are ahead of a have a short video. All right, it's actually like a minute long. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just try to to summarize what what happens. So the, the real video was much longer. I've cut this in different steps just to to uh, show you the, the the key aspects of it. So here's our web interface. Uh, we also have a streaming of the robot arm, and here the smart light. Now he's shaking it so that he can go from. Uh, sideways from the smart light control to the, the element of controlling the light intensity. So here with the inclination, you see that the light intensity changes. Uh, then he's going to shake it again, and it's going to go into, it's going to go from here to here for the, for the color change. So here the interface shows, okay, now you can control the color. And by just inclining it, uh, there, it goes through just a normal color wheel to change the color as well. Um, Later on, then he's going to move also to shake it just to go back to the light. He's going to then shake down to, uh, to go to the arm. And so with this robotic arm as well, it's, it's controlled via web. And um, you'll see that he will just use it to move the arm um, a little bit towards the left and then towards the right. And so here uh, he's now into the robot control. He shakes sideways to enter the menu here. And now he tilts it towards the left, and there's a little bit of a delay um, in the in the webcam video, but here it moved towards the left. The perspective is is from the opposite side, so now he he's going to tilt it a little bit towards the other side, uh, towards the right here, towards this right, and then you'll see that this arm moves towards the other side, right? All right. So this was the demo, just to indicate that gestures con gesture control and in particular, the wireless transmission of these gesture packets can be used to interact with different smart things. In this particular case, we use the web interface. Um, and the, there are things that you can use, for example, web Bluetooth to make sure that there's only one device. In this particular case, there was a, uh, a Raspberry Pi as well to receive the Bluetooth, but this is, let's say, optional. Uh, you can directly communicate with certain uh, web clients through Bluetooth, and you can use that to, let's say, um, trigger different types of actions in different locations. All right, so everything I've shown here, uh, it's not just a, an effort from my side, uh, right? That there, I've, I've worked in different uh, research groups with different professors, with different researchers, and many students uh, who have performed their, their master projects uh, with me uh, to build many of the technologies that I've summarized very briefly <laughs> today. Uh, I'm also very happy to have been able to collaborate with many different companies uh, to make these uh, things possible. So with Mito Miko, we created the Mito card. With Infexel, we were able to, um, to train these uh, uh, nice models for gesture detection. With Epishine, we have these nice organic solar cells. With EPs, we have 
a very um, energy efficient harvesting chip. And with NXP, we've had uh, we've been able to use uh, some some other nice micropropellers as well. And and there are many many others. Overall, it's been a very long road. I, I started my PhD all the way back in 2014, and we've built many different devices um, that have sort of come a path with to towards creating many interesting systems. I didn't get to talk about many of them. For example, this this most recent one, the DPP3. Uh, but this is a very active uh, community research field of batteryless sensing systems. In case you're interested in any of them, please write me an email. I'd be more than happy to to get in touch with you. And um, and yeah, this is all from my side. Um, I can take the remaining questions if there are any. Sure. Uh, thank you very much for this very informative uh, talk. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, there is this poll uh, on your uh, screen right now, so take a minute to just uh, quickly fill that poll. Um, Andres, if you could go to uh, uh, slide 38, uh, there's a question about that. Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah, first you comment that, you know, normally when you talk to people about tiny ML, they say tiny ML uh, is, is for those systems which are operating below a, a milliwatt. So it looks like you have uh, gone much lower than that. So we'll have to find a newer name for what you're doing uh, because you're dealing with microwatts. Uh, uh, the, the question I had was, can you give us any breakdown about the execution time and energy uh, about the different parts of the system that is uh, sensing and then uh, uh, processing and then transmission? Any, any idea about that? Um, yeah, so I, 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 here I only put the, the aggregate values, right? So I don't have them off like a, just to, to give you the, the very exact values, but the energy is basically the area under this curve, right under the power curve. And visually, you can see that the classification part from the InfexL, this area here, this is the biggest, uh, let's say, contributor to the energy. What we have from before, I think it was 109 microgels. Right. This is basically this part here, as well as this part here. Right. So the initialization and the transmission of the BLE. So off the top of my head, I would say roughly 600 microgels were spent in this classification, and I think it takes roughly 20 milliseconds to perform this. Um, in terms of the average value, I, I did not put this because it, it's, it's completely dependent on the environmental conditions, right? So we do need at least 65 microwatts just to sustain, for example, data gathering, right? But if our system, if our, sorry, if our, if our environment provides 100 microwatts, then this system will adjust its execution rate to match 100 microgels, uh, sorry, 100 microwatts. Right? So basically, the, it's an adaptive duty cycling mechanism such that this system will consume only as much energy as the environment provides. Right? So that's why it's, it's, it's not easy to have just a, an average power consumption. But the so range is by, from... Hmm? Yes? So you do that by controlling the, the frequency of the processor or something? Yeah. No, the, no, the frequency of the activations. Right? Okay. So, okay. The, so to minimize the energy, so for example, you said the, the, the processor's frequency, this is something that is uh, used to minimize the energy of the processing itself, right? So obviously, if you have higher frequencies, the, normally the power goes up a little bit, the active power would go up, but you would finish sooner, and then usually you can save some energy by doing things quicker and, uh, and, right, and, and finish early. That's usually the lower energy. But here, this is already, let's say, the end result of the few optimizations that we did um, with some specific settings for voltage, as well as for the for the frequency of the processor. And let's say there is, of course, room for, for improvement here. But just from the microcontroller, we're using the CC2650. Um, it's going to have, regardless of what you do, an active power of tens, tens of milliwatts, right? Um, OK. For the most part. Uh and just, I'm sorry, we have run out of time. There were so many other questions that I need to ask. So could you just move to the, uh, the, the slide right after where you finished? I just have some yes. uh, comments to make. There you go. Yes, uh, the, the one after ah, that. Nice. Yes. This one. Okay, so I just want to again uh, thank our strategic partners, 
next. Uh, our executive uh, strategic partners include ARM, ARM AI uh, virtual tech talks. You should oh, try sorry. to attend them. Sorry. Go ahead. Next. Uh, Edge Impulse, the leading uh, Edge ML platform. Qualcomm, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. Next. Uh, Sentient, end-to-end -end deep learning. And then we have our platinum partners, Deep Light. Next. Uh, Kilkatech. Next. Reality AI. Uh, Renaissance, and then we have our gold strategic partners. For a hub, Maxim, Latent AI, Micro AI, NXP, Seed, uh, Sensimal, ST, Sinsense, and finally, we have our silver strategic partners. Next. Our next talk, like I told you earlier, is on March the 8th. Next. So with that, uh, I would like to thank our uh, speaker, Andres Gomez, for this wonderful talk, and uh, hope to see you all in the next talk.